PPIs, we regularly prescribe them and they're an absolute game changer in terms of the management of peptic disease, but almost not a day goes by without a patient asking me whether they're safe, both in their short and their long-term use. We regularly see articles in newspapers warning the public about their use, and of course there's been a huge amount of medical literature produced exploring whether they offer a significant medical risk. Yet despite the concerns that are raised, they are the most widely prescribed medication worldwide, and of course, they are available over the counter and used by many. So the question is, are they safe? And if they're not, how dangerous are they? And does their danger outweigh their clinical benefits? So what do I say to my patients when I'm initiating a PPI? And what do I say when they ask me if they're safe? In order to discuss this, I thought I'd first address the various concerns that have been raised in the literature and then talk specifically about whether I bring that up with my patients. Now, we're going to start off with some of the easy ones and maybe move on to the harder conversations later on. In regards to GI infections, particularly Clostridium difficile and hospital-acquired pneumonias, there is an association from the data, but this comes from hospitalised, frail patients. This is not something we've seen outside this setting. Certainly, there is a likely to be an increased risk of Clostridium difficile in patients who have long-term PPI use, and I would certainly review the use of PPIs in hospitalised individuals, but I don't specifically discuss this with my patients unless they ask me when I'm in the outpatient setting starting a PPI. Now, there was a concern raised at one point about an association between long-term PPI use and dementia, and this came from two large observational studies. However, the evidence in these studies uh, was of low quality and there were many confounding factors that led to bias. Thus, there is insufficient evidence to suggest that long-term PPI use is linked to dementia and therefore I don't discuss it with my patients routinely unless I'm specifically asked about it. Another area in which there is insufficient evidence and thus I don't discuss with my patients is the potential interaction between clopidogrel and PPI use. There probably is a pharmacodynamic interaction, but the clinical significance of this interaction is not really clear, and there is many conflicting data, and thus, again, I don't necessarily bring it up. There have also been conflicting studies in regards to the risk of osteoporosis and their consequent fractures associated with long-term PPI use, and these concerns were brought up around concerns in regards to the absorption of calcium. There is again insufficient evidence to suggest that patients with, with gastroesophageal reflux disease who don't have significant comorbidities or risk factors of osteoporosis are at any increased risk, and thus I don't bring it up in my consultation unless asked. However, if I'm meeting with patients who have an increased risk of osteoporosis and significant comorbidities, it may be worth discussing this with them, discussing that the risk may be present if it is, it's likely to be small, and that we can then discuss what the benefits are of the medication versus perhaps the potentially small uh, risks of osteoporosis. And of course, you can bring into that conversation a discussion about calcium therapy. The current evidence would suggest that there's an increased, uh, increased risk of worsening someone's chronic kidney disease with long-term PPI use. The exact mechanism for this is not entirely clear, and again, the risk, the actual risk for this seems to be very, very small. But certainly one should be prudent when seeing a patient with chronic kidney disease and prescribing a PPI. And again, I would have that conversation with them. Hypomagnesia is associated with long-term PPI use, but the exact magnitude of this problem is of course unknown as we don't go around checking everyone's magnesium levels within the population. Therefore, of course, it's impossible to know the impact of this in one's day-to-day -day health. Certainly patients with chronic kidney disease should have their magnesium levels checked, but there's insufficient data at the moment to suggest whether we should be checking the normal reflux patient on long-term PPI, whether we should be looking at their magnesium levels, and again, what to do if we do. Um, thus, I don't routinely discuss magnesium with patients uh, when prescribing a PPI, but it is something perhaps I would discuss in those with chronic kidney disease. In regards to other micronutrient deficiencies, there's insufficient evidence to suggest there's any risk with long-term PPI use, and these micronutrient deficiencies are likely more a reflection of overall health and comorbidities rather than PPI use, and thus, again, I don't bring this up. So finally, we come on to the big one, which, of course, as you see attached to this express package, are two papers recently published in GUT discussing the risk of cancer. And these two papers that we've attached here are looking at the risk of colorectal cancer and the risk of gastric cancer associated with long-term PPI use. 
These were produced by the same authors and of course adopt similar methods and they're a really interesting read uh, and of course a huge amount of work. If we look at the colorectal cancer risk paper first, this was produced in the background of many conflicting observational discuss uh, studies discussing a possible link between PPI use and colorectal cancer. Their work is unique as they compare patients who have newly prescribed PPI to those who have newly been prescribed with H2 antagonists. And this is different to other observational studies where they look at PPI use compared to the general population. In this paper, they look at newly prescribed medication in 1.5 million patients in the UK and they followed them up for up to 30 years. They did not find that there was an increased risk of colorectal cancer in patients on long-term PPI use, but they did perhaps show an increased risk of patients who are on increased dose over a long period of time, over four years. And thus, of course, this is worth considering. In regards to uh, their paper on PPI use and gastric cancer risk, they looked at over a million patients in the UK and again adopted similar methods comparing those with newly prescribed PPIs to those with newly prescribed H2 antagonists. In this paper, they did find that patients on long-term PPI use were at an increased risk of gastric cancer and this was thought to be due to the uh, hypogastronemia. This increased risk is quoted to be about 45% increased risk compared to those on H2 antagonists. But in saying that the absolute risk is low, with the number needed to harm just over 2,000 patients for, for five years and um, 1,100 patients for 10 years. Therefore, they conclude that there is an increased risk of gastric cancer, but the absolute risk remains very low. So what do we do with the information? Do we discuss it with our patients? And I think probably we are obliged to discuss with our patients in terms of there may be an increased risk of gastric cancer, albeit very low. It's important to have this discussion in regard to the impact of their symptoms on their life and really what are the treatment alternatives. It's certainly important to have the discussion in patients who you foresee them taking PPIs in the long term, for example in our cohort of bats esophagus patients, and really you need to find that risk balance, but perhaps you can reassure them by saying they're going to have a regular endoscopy anyway. In short, this may sound like an obvious thing to say, but do not prescribe a PPI unless it, is, unless it is clinically indicated, and do not leave a patient on a PPI unless there is clear clinical benefit. If you see a patient who has taken a PPI, you should review the indication and discuss with them why they're taking it and how long have they been on it. In my experience, many patients I see do not know the answer to these questions, and certainly in my practice I explore the PPI use and advise them to stop it when it's appropriate. But for patients who have true gastroesophageal reflux disease, whose symptoms do not respond to lifestyle and dietary changes, we know that this condition has a significant impact on the quality of their life. We also know these patients have limited choice. They can put up with their symptoms or they can take a medication that is effective but may carry some long-term risks, albeit small. We know the surgical option carries with it significant morbidity and mortality and doesn't necessarily mean they'll be off PPIs forever. And so for many of our patients, this isn't an appropriate step, particularly in the context of the fact that medication is effective. Therefore, there is undoubtedly a gap here in our treatment algorithm of gastroesophageal reflux disease and other peptic diseases. And perhaps this is where endoscopic therapies can sit, where we can address this treatment gap. I invite you to watch the fantastic example of endoscopic fund duplication by Rayhan Hager on our site and of course read these two associated papers on cancer risk and make your own conclusions.